My point with that punctuation at the end there is really that I feel not only is the tradition of Arcadia, whatever I may discover that to be, or whatever use the word has, <coughs> and I deliberately haven't looked it up in the Oxford Dictionary, uh, because I would prefer to pervert its interpretation than to be told accurately what it means, which would foreclose the argument. Um, I feel instinctively that the tradition of Arcadia, for me, is in direct contradiction not only to the implication of the previous pair of slides. Um, oh, that's an amusing thing. To Help, yes. But it's not only in contradiction to uh, what may or may not interest Mr. Tafuri and his fellow Marxists, or neo-Marxists, or neo-neo-Marxists, or those who talk about Marxism, um, but in fact is a kind of underbelly current which perhaps has cropped up more or less at various times in our his history um, I say our history because I think I'm looking at this obviously from a very autobiographical point of view as, as the wet English liberal provincial, um, but also looking at it as some kind of architect who finds that despite what one has been taught to love and to hate, that there are certain aspects of nostalgia, but also nostalgia for the future that might never have been simultaneously with the more normally accepted nostalgia of what we uh, pretend that we don't like. And so I'm calling this second step in, in uh, Arcadia because about, I think it's five or six years ago, it's really quite a long time ago, when Alvin Boyarsky wasn't running a school of architecture, but was running a school of architecture monkey called the um, Summer Session, the IID, in the first summer session, I gave a lecture called Arcadia, and I simply strung together a whole lot of things that I sort of was coming back to quite liking, and then claimed for this that uh, perhaps it could rest under the portmanteau term. And it's very sort of slow gestation period that I come back more recently to thinking that perhaps one can not only string a few things that one likes together, but perhaps one can use this as a starting point for a series of projects. And so this evening is quite simply a rather rapid um, sort of self-analysis of whether one second look at Arcadia is proving useful, already beginning to anticipate that, that the third step in looking at Arcadia will probably be to try to incorporate um, a much wider range of uh, artifacts and a much wider range of cultural turn-ons uh, and that the fourth stage of looking at Arcadia may well be to try to uh, define some kind of general uh, procedure, some kind of general, uh, dare I say it, philosophy, which this embodies. I suspect that when one reaches that fourth stage, the thing will be kill killed stone dead and I shall want to move on. Um, the other thing is the contradictoriness of certain aspects of Arcadia. The slide on the left, I think I took from a copy of a slide in that drawer in slide libraries, which is always called sort of in brackets, nasty, sort of uh, what we should not do with our towns. Um, it, it sort of probably goes into that drawer and out of it every 10 years, depending upon where the state of the game is. And the slide on the right is, is one of our favorite uh, nostalgic London suburbs, which is called Bedford Park, except that it's the back of something at Bedford Park, not the bit that you usually uh, photograph, and it is the part which is organic, which is uh, fairly dégagé, the part which is not being built primarily by the, the high architects of Bedford Park, but which has just sort of grown. And yet, somehow or other, there's a clue. I did a project, as you know, called The Secret Garden, and I think that, despite the uh, the cloyingness of its title, and this whole thing for, for, for many of you probably is very cloying, as I almost sort of find myself. Um, the idea of the secret garden, the child's view of the world, um, one finds surprisingly that, that what comes through the, the material is that it's not just the child's view of the world, but some very much more sophisticated 
minds have also looked and tried to create secret gardens and that the constituent element of the secret garden seems to be uh, making geometry kind of, it, it seems to be eating away geometry, riddling the thing away, riddling away the architecture and then placing into it only such objects as you really take a delight in. And that process intrigues one. The process of finding an Arcadian atmosphere, whatever that might be, which is not restricted to the Anglo-Saxon sort of suburban, spotty, provincial ideal, but can be found in places like La Jolla or this slide. I'm a very bad historian. I haven't had time to check out where all these things are. I think some of them are Tuscan, some of them are German, and some of them are in sort of Wiltshire. It doesn't really matter to me very much. These are English. Um, the little seat, I think, is nice because it, it s is steeped in, in high... It's not even just bourgeois, it's sort of high bourgeois. You know, only somebody very special and privileged and uh, with, with the time and money to waste on such useless objects could create such a thing and probably not even ever sit in it. But it is a small object symbolizing a kind of grand situation. Now that is, for me, an incredible audacity. Um, the idea of, of the Ranelagh Gardens and, and the, uh, the gardens in Vauxhall, again, was to do with absurdity, was to do with idealism. And I think, for me, the essence of Arcadia is a kind of continual optimism allied with a certain kind of atmospheric thing, which I can't quite put my finger on. And so this is really a very boring thing, which is called somebody standing up, uh, showing a lot of material, saying, I cannot actually tell you why I think this is about what I think it's about, but it's somewhere there. Somewhere it is. Somewhere it is. It's a very non-structural view of the thing. And the easiest thing for me to do, I suppose, is to try and draw it. And to draw it, this is a drawing that was purporting to be describing a physical condition in a vocabulary of architecture, which ended up by being really a kind of self-generating, very self-indulgent collection of bits and pieces that I quite liked and that perhaps quite deliberately didn't fit terribly well together. Um, and for me, I find myself being the third person this evening that shows pictures of, of greenhouses. Maybe there's some clue in that, that the greenhouse, the absurdity of trying to have a climatic situation and a kind of vegetation situation um, in a place where this is not normal nor encouraged is, is to do with Arcadia. The business of tailoring the landscape, the business of a symbiosis between landscape and architecture, not in the normal sort of elemental sense of saying this is where the building and the landscape meet, but this is where we make a building become uh, more landscape than landscape, or this is where we make a landscape become more building than most buildings, fascinates. The business of the quaint object, whether by a very particular kind of contrivance, by its form and its, its very arch sort of nostalgia, or just in the, I suspect, almost the accident of that aerial photograph that makes the pimple look really more exciting than perhaps it is, although some of you sitting in the room might say it's something to do with a certain kind of curve. Um, this is a situation. The situation of form uh, bent slightly out of context. My real love for the Palm House at Kew is not really to do with Victoriana, I would, I would claim, um, although it probably is really, but it's to do with it being the first 1960s building. I liked it at the time when I started taking slides of it because it looked like an inflatable. Um, <coughs> but it wasn't an inflatable, it was much better than most inflatables when you get inside it, but it was because it looked like an inflatable that it turned me on. It's a very naughty reason, <laughs> but why not? Um, again, the, the thought of, of topiary, uh, the one saying office is particularly good, but uh, I think topiary itself says all that I need to say about man contriving nature to absurd ends. Uh, and these are just some more from Bedford Park. Bedford Park is Arcadian. I think 
partly because it isn't quite as good as it ought to be. I think there's probably something about Arcadia which is to do with English second-ratedness. But English second-ratedness, which, which isn't the product of extremely worthy ideals, um, maybe they thought they were worthy, but in fact they were still for what Rodney Mace would see as a, an incredibly elite situation. So that for me, the business of, of accident, not only being permitted, but in fact uh, coming about because people weren't clever enough to avoid it, is, is something to do with this thing. The toy aspect, I, I use the slide, some of you will have heard me use the slide on the left in at least six different types of lecture, and it never fails uh, because, as I've said before, it summarizes the sort of Englishness of things, the nice place, the small scale, the nice people looking at nice flowers, um, and it is less obvious than the slide on the right, which is, which is, you know, toy town, and very, very kind of, um, is obviously a sort of Arcadia of, of, of the little funny thing. The one on the left is slightly less obviously funny, but I find it's really tarred with the same brush. I have for it uh, a love, hate relationship. I almost like the architecture, but it's irritatingly precious. And yet, I find myself pulled towards that aspect of, of Arcadianism, that one takes a scheme that we did for a house at an intersection, one then starts to pervert it when it's called an apartment block for the, for the uh, purposes of sustaining a drawing which purports to be about suburbia, one says, okay, it's going to be an apartment block because that's a functional thing to call it, and then it's all right as part of the program. But in, in addition to probably desecrating it in that way, um, one also deliberately wants to desecrate it in terms of eating into it, of, of almost destroying the idea that you first came up with, albeit that that idea was moderately complex in the first place. And this brings me to the straightforward first analysis, and this, can, this, is, this is the first time I've tried to describe the four projects together um, as Arcadias. They simply, so far, have carried, in very small lettering on the left-hand side, um, Arcadias A, B, C, and D, and then in brackets, the search for um, an ideal suburbia. And I deliberately pose them as four alternative kinds of Arcadia because I do not know yet what the summary of, of what Arcadian architecture should be. And so one simply took four different stabs in slightly contradictory directions. The first one is probably the least successful as a single image. It's, it is a composite. It, part of it is the intersection house. Part of it is an orchard which goes back to other orchard projects and preoccupations with orchards. Part of it is, is hedge houses in the front. And I think the whole thing is to do very simply with the placing of special architecture in a sylvan setting, in a romantic setting, Arcadia being the dream of the optimist that says, why shouldn't it be all right? Rather than always worrying about why it isn't all right. Um, and is incredibly hedonistic and expensive and bourgeois and rather pleasant and quiet. And the quiet aspect of the thing, I think, is, is uh, a curious one because um, I suspect if those four fairly substantial buildings were placed alongside, let's say, uh, Edgware, which is sort of where they're meant to be, uh, you would notice them and somebody might say, well, some uh, rather self-conscious architect has been at work here. Um, and yet, I would hope that the thing still comes across as quiet. And so, this slide seemed to summarize that aspect of things. The business of the particular object used theatrically. Um, I use, in a way, not only high architecture to support my argument, but also high landscaping. One cannot pretend, can one, that Starhead is really part of the spotty provincial culture. It's very unspotty. It is technically provincial, but in fact, in, in many respects, is metropolitan in its sophistication and its scale and its degree of contrivance. And so for me, one aspect has to be 
that of contrivance. Again, the thing which perhaps certain uh, people in a politically different position from myself would find extremely irritating the fact that one is wanting to contrive and to titillate and to enjoy and to also not be too shrill about it, although perhaps I am being this evening, it's just sort of the, the Marxist conversation started sending me off to sleep. Um, and I, that's just a sort of comeback on that one. Um, it's nice to find in the back of, of a very boring town called Hove some of the best material. Now, that, of course, those of you who know Hove, the only town that provides lavatories specifically for dogs, marks as such, uh, maybe has, has the beginnings of Arcadianism in it. Uh, and so the best example of, of the hedge house window comes from Hove. The hedge house in the front there, the idea of a house being a hedge is something which uh, the only other people that I know have got, got involved in this, I, Diana Giles's tree house for instance, um, puts it in a very special place, whereas what I wanted to do was to make the hedge house very ordinary, a lot of hedge and therefore a number of houses and the fact that it was repetitious appealed to me. That it was also a studio house, um, more or less in the tradition of the Edwardian studios that you find again around these rather creepy suburbs of London. Creepiness, spookiness uh, is for me also a clue to Arcadia. This is a much finer waterfall I think probably too hot for what I was trying to get at, but it's, there's something about the spooky quality of the waterfall and whatever it is that's going on on the left-hand side of it um, that appeals as material. One has a love-hate relationship, therefore, with the rhetorical architecture. The actual glass parts of that building are rhetorical because not only are they shaped and they are tall, but they fragment in a very particular way and the fragmented part is, is moderately strong and therefore able to create in the center of the composition and I use that terrible word composition which we haven't been able to use for the last 10 years but now we can breathe a great sigh of relief and use it again. The center of the composition is an axis and so in the Romantic English tradition one wants to uh, explode that axis and place a winding <coughs> path as winding paths are meant to do, disappear into the unknown. Um, and it in fact disappears through into the trellised area, the private place, the, the private place that contains within it some more buildings, some more houses, houses which are lost in amongst their own greenery. And I couldn't find a historical example for this because quite fortunate, I was quite pleased that I couldn't in the A slide library because I thought, hey, maybe one's onto something that they haven't quite built yet. The business of private space which is tied by a barrier or a near barrier, I suppose the, the uh, drawing is much closer to the right hand slide than the left hand one. The left hand one is back into the secret garden conversation where you knock on the door, the door is opened and then the vision is there, whereas the slide on the right is actually sort of telling you more or less what is there, leading you on in a very relaxed way. You don't actually have to make any brave gesture to go on inside. Um, and you go on inside and you are led further on by a series of tantalizations. Um, and in fact in that composition itself, this one, there is a very clear uh, layering. The, 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 the curiousness, I think, looking back on that drawing, which took the longest time by about three to one of all the four drawings, because it was tentative, because I, I did it, didn't like it, changed it, uh, have, have suppressed the original version, which some of you may remember with the African hut version of the, the back houses. Um, I think it was because I was, was starting off on, on this attempt to uh, comment on Arcadia and like, you know, the old story of people's first building, one puts everything barring the kitchen sink into the first attempt and only later does one begin to discriminate. The 
discriminated version doesn't contrast with it as much as I would have liked. Although it looks different from the first, uh, the program is still somewhat the same, is to do with placing a series of fingers which could absorb almost anything. So it's back to the old megastructure conversation in a curious way. But then one leaves most of the things that it could take off. Whereas in the old megastructure, one stuck everything onto the thing. What's nice, in other words, it's a very, very uneconomic project indeed. Uh, one of those things has almost got nothing on it at all. So you build this enormous um, servicing, carrying object, a sort of corridor with a few toilets and pipes and cats and so on in it. And then you just leave it. And the wall is deliberately there, the stone wall, is deliberately there to prevent the general public from really seeing what's going on. There is just a hint um, from the outside, from the, from the suburban street. This is a sort of pinner version, I think, rather than the edgeware version of the previous example. We're out at pinner here, where even the suburban street itself is already quite uh, quiet and tree-lined and not heavily built upon. <coughs> and the land rolls away, um, there's no particular point at which the, the Arcadian suburb gives way. My favorite bit, and this is a sort of a, admission of failure of nerve, my favorite bit is the house which sticks out in the front, uh, which in character, I suspect, is nearest to that of the first Arcadian. Um, but this business of walls and what you might what might be behind them is, is, I suppose, a fundamental one, a fundamental theatrical trick again. And, and I'm forced into admitting that uh, in this whole Arcadian business, one is back in, in the episodic tradition of not only English literature uh, and English theatre, but I suspect English architecture as well, that it is a series of, of strung together episodes um, and that the player in the game may never actually discover what the storyline was. And this, I think, at a cultural level, makes what we do incredibly different from that in most of continental Europe, <coughs> and probably rather different from the other sort of pragmatic American tradition, that uh, the charm of most English people who I like and I hope that Colin Rowe will fall into that trap tomorrow, that, that the charm of what Colin Rowe has to say is that it never quite adds up, that it's a series of episodes that happen to appeal to him at that moment. And you have to do the work of, of, of stringing them together and coming to some conclusion, which seems to be totally opposite to taking an extremely uh, definite polemical line and then gathering together the information to support it or destroy it. Um, I think this strange sort of fiddling around wayward English thing is what I'm getting at. And it doesn't matter to me if these are not English examples, uh, which I suspect they're not, but I'm not very good at... <coughs> yes, they're not, are they? But it doesn't really matter because what intrigues me about them is that there are a whole lot of, of irrelevances cropping up in them. You start having a tailored piece of garden and then it gets sort of very tatty at the edges. You have these two things creating some kind of axis, but it doesn't appear to be leading to anything very important. On the left, um, the clue there is the sunken garden, as you probably remember from a project that I did called Prepared Landscape, where I was very interested in, in, a, in a more rhetorical way of the building never appearing above the land. Uh, here, in this second Arcadia, there are a whole lot of influences. One is of some of the buildings never appearing above the land, that some of them create sort of pits of, of place. Some of it, even dare I admit, that awful influence upon English architecture in the period when I was a student, which was the, the sort of Italian hill town business, at the crumbly aesthetic, the picturesque space, and the real reason why so many English architects like Port Grimo is that apart from 
the, uh, their necessity to hate the architecture, it actually carries through a lot of that aesthetic of, of the 1960s. The business of contained places and bent places, I mean the business of bending the ground but in a sort of geometrical sense, I mean, this, I think, is, is, is the nearest slide so far to what, what I'm trying to get at in, in the second Arcadia, where the ground, it's, it's definitely ground, and it's definitely folded, but, and it's very geometrically folded, but just at that point when you're expecting a very sharp event here, as one does, if, if, if it were a sort of uh, East Coast American situation, where it would really be bent, and that would be very definite thing, or this would be very separated, then you soften it. I mean, you, you, you do a very dramatic thing. And then as soon as you've made that dramatic statement, everything is, the edges are all softened, as if you did it with a very hairy pencil that didn't quite work. Um, and that gives one, I think, a very, very magic situation. There is the hint <coughs> of a building here, but you can't really quite see it well enough to tell whether it is a building. There is the hint of some statement about entering to that building, but again you can't, you know, the fact that the slide's slightly smudgy helps. And to me, this very prepared edge of tree here is the hint of an even better building, because it almost reaches the geometrical rigidity of a building, but it's a tree. And so there's a sort of paradox, layered on paradox, layered on paradox there. Um, and just to remind oneself of the drawing again, there is the attempt to create these kinds of situations, albeit, of course, in a very architectural way. And this one, this particular Arcadia, is the one I kind of don't really like as much as, as the others, um, because it is very architectural, and I, all the time I'm very conscious of it being like other architecture that I have seen on drawings. Um, and so one's not sure whether in the whole thing one's make, oh, oh, making a series of parodies, you know, even sometimes parodies of oneself in previous <coughs> times, parodies of, of the prepared landscape, of the obelisk seen on an axis, of a certain kind of Germanic or constructivist architecture, of sunk architecture, of old things. And the business of the piece of architecture, it is, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> the, the business of the piece of architecture held by the landscape is also important, <coughs> I think. I mean, most of the remarks I'm making, there's the, the business of obelisks, and I'm very, I'm very cynical about obelisks and ley lines and things seen on axes, and yet I find in this particular instance, I used, I'm still slightly using everything by the kitchen sink. I was throwing that in, if, let's have an obelisk there, because it's just the sort of thing you need to make this, this uh, artificial landscape screen come alive, you know? So one's, thought, one's using a very historicist device there, of having a nice thing and then breaking it and then putting a rather alien compositional game through it. The, the third Arcadia is the one that then, I think having done the first two, I wanted to sort of shrilly attack them uh, for being very much to do with vegetation, very much to do with, you know, nature and, and the building wrapping themselves inside out of each other. And so one said, right, here is a sort of whopping or New York uh, suburbia. Here is a place which is definitely uncompromising. No material used is natural. Even the internal courtyard and its own landscape is a non-natural landscape. And the, the forerunner of this is very definitely the sleek project of about a year before that drawing. The idea of the sleek building, totally artificial, albeit in this case being slightly threatened or cancerously attacked by the night.